Hey guys, welcome to another fun episode of TFL Talking Cars. And with me is, not always, but this time is... Nathan, hey guys. And you know, Nathan, we're here because we're gonna bestow our wisdom <laughs> onto the uh, many CEOs of the many car companies that we're gonna be fixing during this episode. That's true. Uh, we're sorry to put you through this, guys. And bear in mind that we're just giving our opinion and we wanna hear from you, by all means. So write below what you think we should be doing to fix some of these car companies. <laughs> what you think you'd be doing. <laughs> yeah. But well, let's start off with a car company that, let's, uh, let's face it, um, we, we, we've talked about them an awful lot. Actually, actually, we're going to go the other way. We're going to leave that car company to the end. So last week we did an episode, this is part two, called, oh, this is, yeah. Yeah, this is how we fix Nissan and other struggling car companies. Well today, Nathan, we're going to be talking about this is how we'd fix Jaguar, Land Rover, and other struggling car companies, but we're going to leave that for last. Uh, first, we're going to talk about Buick. Yes. Then we're going to talk about BMW Mini, and then we're going to talk about Ford, and then JLR at the end. So, if you want to know how we'd fix all these, well, sort of kind of struggling car companies, come on back right after the intro. Sit back and relax, or keep driving if you're driving. TFL Talking Cars is on the air, the world's most popular car podcast. Okay, maybe not yet, but we're working on it. All right, Nathan, um, let's start with Buick. Buick used to be a car company, now they're <laughs> a crossover company. I mean, let's face it, that's exactly what they're doing. And there are two different places where you could put this. I want a Buick crossover. I don't want a Buick crossover. Seriously, that's really where everybody is right now. Buick used to build cars, and some pretty good cars, too. I actually do, I thought the Regal was one of their better cars, especially for handling and for packaging. It was great. And they had a wagon. Remember that wagon, the, um, the was the, the Tour X or whatever it was called? Yeah, you liked sell. that quite a bit. I liked it, didn't sell. But let's, yeah. before we get to that, let's take a, like, a big step backward and rewind the clock back to, well, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember uh, 10 years ago when the auto industry was in a tailspin? Uh, we had gone from selling something like 16 million units, which is cars and trucks a year, to 10 million. Mm -hmm. About half of the uh, car sales just evaporated. Uh, and GM was sitting there thinking what car brands to keep and what car brands to sell, right? Right. And so uh, they flushed a whole bunch of, which I think really cool brands, Hummer. They got rid of Hummer, they got rid of Pontiac, and they got rid of Oldsmobile. Yeah, but they kept Buick. And you know why they kept Buick? Well, Buick was selling well. In China. In China, but also here in the <laughs> no, States. It was no, selling well in China. Yeah, they, well, they were, they're, they're still doing quite well in China, which is probably their saving grace. Uh, but here in the States, Buick's sales numbers have been fairly stable, even through that financial downturn. The thing is, Buick is no longer quite the Buick that it used to be. Yeah, there was this old thing, right? GM had this old kind of marketing strategy that, let's say you were um, the everyman, then you'd buy a Chevy. If you were the doctor, then you'd buy the Cadillac, but if you were the dentist, you'd buy the Buick. Buick, exactly. And that was where Buick fit into kind of the GM lineup. Yeah. But when it all went south, they decided to keep it. Let's just be real about this, dude, because Buick has a very good reputation for being kind of uh, a high-end, uh, showing off your money kind of car in China. Used to be one of their most reliable brands too. Yeah, but in China, and so Buick, you know, was selling cars hand over fist in China. Mm -hmm. It was it actually helped keep GM alive, and so they couldn't really flush it, right? They had right. to keep it. And then the, the, then the problem was uh, that they really didn't have like cars to sell under the Buick name, and so what they did was they went to their Opel division, which they also sold, right? And they I said, know, you know that's... what? We'll do. We'll take Opels and we'll rebrand them as Buicks. Which I thought was great for a while. <laughs> yeah, I, no, like, I did because they were fun cars. Right, but it's, it's not what Buick ever was. <laughs> no, no, that's the problem. And, and one of the things I remember, that Roman and I uh, went to... Right, the dentist was like, you know what, I need an Opel Vauxhall. So I, I know, I know, I know. So Roman and I went to this event, an ice driving event, remember? Yeah. Uh, years and years ago, it, it was for the new Buick Regal GS with the all-wheel drive system. And it was actually a really fun event. We went to like, Nova Scotia. Where, 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 where did we go? Anyway, we went, we went uh, east. And yeah, while we were, we were there, yeah, it, it was, was in Canada. It was and, in Canada. And, yeah. and while we were there, and we were driving and filming and having a really good time and doing our thing, um, I decided to ask the marketing person at the time about it, saying, "You know, um, Buick has never really been known for for you know exciting sports cars." And they brought up the one Buick that everybody knows it was a fairly exciting car, the Grand National. And I, I was trying to be polite, but I was like, "Dude." 
this isn't a Grand National. I mean, that, that was a very different car, and that was like a one-off thing. This is a whole brand you're pulling out here. I mean, this is Regal, and you're going all the way across the line. They didn't really have an answer for that, but here's their new answer. We're getting rid of it. Anything that has a trunk is no longer being sold by Buick, and I think that's a mistake. Yeah, I, I think what happened was, you know, the company lost its brand heritage, right? Mm -hmm. When you started, when they started rebranding Vauxhalls as Buicks, Opals as Buicks, uh, and then, then reselling them here, you know, the Cascada, right? Mm -hmm. Remember the Cascada? Yeah, well, it wasn't a terrible car. No, well, actually, it's just I, bad timing. I actually like the Cascada. It's a bad I'm, name. I think I'm the only person that likes that no, car. No, because you like convertibles, you have hair. You, you can enjoy it. <laughs> but, you know, but I, I remember driving at the Key West, you know, I liked it. I loved the, uh, uh, was it the Cross Tour, right? That was... That was their wagon. Yeah. It was a brilliant wagon. It was a, it was, I it thought was a it European was... Opal wagon, rebranded. Once Better again. than most crossovers. And I remember uh, the uh, little uh, sporty. Uh, oh, the uh, then been uh, uh, Verano. Verano. Verano yeah. Turbo. It looked like the from the back. It looked like Angry Birds. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. The Verano was. Uh, yeah, that was that that uh, that car had issues. It was it was basically a uh, rebranded uh, Chevy Cruze. Yeah, Opal, whatever. Anyway, yeah. so so you you had a very strong brand with a very strong brand identity that then lost kind of you know GM didn't want to build. Buicks from the ground up, right? Because it's very expensive. It is pricey, yeah. Yeah, and so it kind of became, uh, I think a dumping ground is too strong, but it kind of became this kind of like catch-all for, for other platforms that GM had in its, um, in its box of cars and crossovers, and then they rebrand them as Buicks. And I think when you do that, and you lose kind of the DNA of what makes that brand. Right. right? I mean, I'm, you know, maybe, maybe we're, I'm old, I don't know, dude, but- Well, like, you, you are. are but remember, like, Buick had some really cool, uh, classic American cars. Big cruisers. Big and, cruisers, yeah. right. These were cars, like, you know, like, like once again, if you were the dentist and you quite couldn't afford the Eldorado, you could get yourself an Electra. Right. Remember, remember those vehicles? Oh, I, I, I do. I do. And actually, I had some family members who have owned them. And Buick had their own brand identity. They had their own feel to them. They were, they were the car that you aspired to. If you didn't want to be ostentatious, if you didn't want to be over the top of the Cadillac, and Buicks, you know, I buy a Buick if you want a car that lasts was yeah. sort of the, one of the things. I think, and even like um, we, I have, we have a friend here in Colorado who has a very big car collection, and he collects a lot of Buicks, right? That's his thing. He collects weird, kind of strange brands, but he's yeah. got a lot of Buicks. And the reason he collects old, like muscle car era Buicks, is because they were always better built than like the Chevy equivalent, right? Mm -hmm. So they always put a little bit more engineering into them. Yeah. Uh, so they were a little bit more, you know, robust. They were a little bit more, uh, uh, and th that's what Buick stood for. And I, and I think when you know GM decided to keep Buick and uh, not keep Pontiac, if it had been just from an American point of view, not from a you know global point of view, then I think. Pontiac would have been the much stronger brand. Well, Pontiac keep. was sort of their excitement brand. Now, in fact, that's how they marketed them for years and years and years. They had guys like John DeLorean work on some of those cars. They had some... Right, the GTO, right? I mean, right, GTO. I mean, even the Fiero, as bizarre and bananas as that car was, it brought in a whole youth market into this thing. They, nobody else at GM built a car like that. It was specifically built for Pontiac. And they're Firebird. I had a, a fire chicken for a while. And, um, right, I mean, they were the kind of the excitement, like mm -hmm. you said, they were, and, and I think... That was a real shame that from, they got rid of Pontiac. Yeah, from a brand standpoint, if you were just looking at the U.S. market, you would have probably kept Pontiac, because it had more, you know, you, I mean, let's face it, Buick and, and Cadillac in some ways are very similar, right? Whereas Pontiac was its own thing. <clears throat> True. Now, the thing with Buick right now is that... Uh, and, and yeah, let's let, talk about right now. So yeah, that, that was my, 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 my delve into and, this. And, and I agree with you to a certain extent. Um, now, Cadillac has moved on. A lot of rear drive platforms. A lot of, you know, there's specifically, you know, cars built for them. An engine that cost them billions that they never used. The Black Wing or whatever. Um, all that stuff is on Cadillac. Buick, what they've done is they've taken uh, European and Korean uh, vehicles, basically. And they've put Buick badges on them, and they're not bad vehicles. I've driven three of their crossovers, and they're not bad at all. They're, they're very comfortable. They, my sister actually has an Encore uh, that's like four years old. She drives the crap out of it, and trust me, she beats it up cr like crazy uh, in Colorado. And it's great. It but works. why would you get it over the Chevy version? That's my question. Why? Oh, she likes the nicer interior. Okay. Bottom line. So, just, so you're saying now Buick has become the GMC of Chevy. It's, it's, it's exactly that. That's, yeah. that's exactly, it's like a nicer Chevy. And 
That's almost their entire lineup is nicer vehicles so, than Chevy. So with produces. GMC is trucks, Buick is crossovers. Pretty much. And I think that's exactly where they're going. I think that Buick, well, I know for a fact, Buick no longer builds cars. They build crossover SUVs, well, just crossovers. And I think the big question that a lot of people have to ask is, is this the direction we really want this former luxury brand to go into? Because let's face it, it's only so much passion you can get out of a crossover. There's only so much American feel that you can get out of a crossover. And you're not gonna convince so, people that so, they're European. So how do we fix it? Well, it's very simple. I have a simple, well, let's hear your solution. Take some of those Cadillacs that yeah. are way overpriced yeah. and uh, water them down a little bit and make them Buicks. I'm serious. There are so many Cadillacs out there, AT46Z, you know, whatever, you know, all the silly names that they have for them. And you and I both agree, which is in the last video, that they need to bring names back. But take those cars and pull some of the ridiculous tech off there, die down just a little tiny bit, put them back in the Buick. Make Buicks out of Cadillacs. That's so, what I say. So here's what I would do, okay? Mm -hmm. And I don't know about brand, but this would be an interesting experiment. You know how Tesla came along? Um, and so what happened in America, obviously, was uh, initially, uh, you know, manufacturers had dealerships that would sell their vehicles. And mm -hmm. then over the years, the dealerships became bigger and more powerful, and they became so powerful that they passed legislation basically not allowing the manufacturer to sell cars outside of the dealership. Right. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Like, we're, I, I, we're, 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 we're like, like, you know, like GM can sell cars. You know, as GM, right? right they have they, to go through a dealer network, which is ridiculous, right? Which is, which is, and then Tesla came along and basically said, you know what? That's horse poop, right? Being kind here, yeah. Uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna go to court, and we're gonna, you know, it's not free market. It certainly is. They isn't free fought market. it in several states. No, they fought it in every state. Yeah, and they won. Yeah. Except for I think, except for Michigan, which makes sense. The Tesla, maybe Texas, and I think even well, in Texas, I think Texas has changed, and they have some sort yeah. of agreement. Yeah, but but the only state where Tesla can sell direct, right, is mm. now Michigan, mm. which makes sense, of course. Well, yeah. of course, Michigan, water city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so my solution to Buick would be. Uh, if I were a GM and if I were Mary Barra, I'd be like, guys, let's buy all those franchises back and let's make Buick the direct sales and see if we can make it work. That's not a terrible get, idea. Get, so, That's, sorry, get rid, of the, get rid of the dealerships. Oh, yeah, I, I have and, no problem getting rid of dealerships. And then you, you don't have to have like, them buy into whatever brand direction you decide to go. Mm -hmm. So if you decide you know, one day you know, Buick's gone and it's now Pontiac, you can do it. I, you know, whatever you want to do. But you know, buy those dealerships back and then you know, use that as a kind of a test bed for selling direct uh, to the customer. You what know, do you guys think of that? That's not a terrible idea. And then add, to add to that, a lot of Cadillac dealerships are deliberately uh, selling the farm because yeah, of the, the requirements of uh, going of GM, to yeah, EV. Yeah. So why not make those into Buick dealerships and making those direct sales uh, dealerships? But I, I truly do believe that uh, Cadillac, they're not selling a lot of cars. And I do think that some of their, their smaller vehicles should be physically changed, not looking like Cadillacs. They should look like Buicks softer lines and everything else and make them into Buicks and sell them. So, That's so I think. I, I, you know, I think Tesla, you know, a lot of people give Tesla a lot of grief. And, and rightfully so sometimes. And rightfully so. But they have led the way. So I can, give you, I can give you a list of like probably five things that they have led the way that other car companies are doing now, right? Hmm. First, of course, over the year updates. Yeah. Right? That, that's huge, and, and, and everybody else is catching up to them on that yeah. one. Yeah, electrification. Well, obviously. Right? Yeah. Because that, that, of course, now everybody else is starting to do. Mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, their, you know, their dealer uh, model, which is, uh, like I said, unique in that there are none. Uh, but I think that if you can cut out the middleman, if you're a manufacturer, why wouldn't you do that? Right? Because that's what, that's what dealership is, in effect. It's a middleman. Yeah. I, yes. Yes, it is. And, and throughout history, if you wanted to make things cheaper, just... Yes, and we know, and we've just recently had this issue, dealerships tend to bump the price. And in some cases, they're remorseless about it. Now, they did it to us with the Raptors. I mean, how many times did you go and find a Raptor for over 100 grand? Yeah, I know, I mean, it's it crazy. It was just pathetic. And they, they did it because they could. Yeah. And I'm, we're not going to go into a tirade about sure, uh, what's wrong with dealerships because yeah, that, know, that's a whole video but, in itself. But, but I'm sure that, that the manufacturers are just sitting there like, like what, what the heck, guys? You know, this is, you, you may be getting, you know, over sticker on these cars, but it's really hurting the brand, right? And it's hurting us because, because it, it feels like we're price gouging you. Yeah. And then Tesla's out there actually doing the exact opposite, saying not only, you know, you don't, you don't have to negotiate, but, you know, 
uh, based on a lot of, you know Musk's whim, we might cut the price by <laughs> two thousand. It, it depends on if he's smoking one night or drinking another <laughs> night or whatever, whatever he's in the mood for. Yeah, but but it, you know what I mean. But but it's it's unilateral. I, I I agree. I agree. And and once again, this is you know. Do you remember Saturn? Yeah. Another GM thing that yeah. they got rid of, which had potential. Um, no dick or sticker. They, yeah, exactly. They had that for a while, and I know it drove some people nuts, but what they did is they paid a salary to their employees. Now, rumor has it they still got bonuses, but not from sales, from other things. Don't know about that, but the point was, I actually went into a dealership, and I decided, and this was, I was right out of college, and I decided to mess with them a little bit. I'm like, yeah, so you can make me a deal? Nope, no deal. Oh, really? So no commission? Well, we have a standard commission. And that was it, and I loved it. And I thought, well, why doesn't everybody else do this? So, that's and so GM had the idea before. Look, they just look, dropped it. Apple's doing it to great success, right? Right. And, you know, for the most part, they cut out the middleman. They go direct to consumer. We're doing that too with our T-shirts. <laughs> yes. What you see is what you get. <laughs> yeah, by the way, if you want one of our T-shirts, uh, check out the link below. Uh, we're doing like a two for three for the holiday right now. Yeah, Ducko.com, and yeah. we we even have our own little thing on the page. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's shameless. I, I just actually, couldn't help actually, it. We're, you know, we're doing this uh, with a local company. This is not something that's actually generating a lot of revenue, but it is building our brand. So no, and, and there's no haggle either. There's just no just haggling. remember that part. Yeah, there's no haggling. Uh, so anyway, um, like I said, you know, Apple's done it. Tesla's done it. I, I expect over the next ten years there will be you know a manufacturer that's not Tesla that will also still start. Oh, I guarantee it. In fact. One of the things that COVID is showing us is that changes are necessary, and people are going to be used to not going to a dealership. Well, look, you're a perfect example of that, Nathan. I am a perfect example. Yes, you just bought a Leaf through Carvana, right? And it was painless, right? They bring first of all this idea of I, like, actually Carmax. Carmax? Yeah, I did Carvana with the last one. Okay, so anyway, I've done two cars through. through anyway, online. They, they bring the car to you. Mm -hmm. You you know they help finance it. Uh, if you don't like it, you can return it. Seven uh, days. They warranty it. You don't have to get all those stupid phone calls. Hey, you know, is your warranty? Right? <laughs> no, you know, I noticed your warranty is. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and you don't haggle about the price. And you know, sometimes just that less stress is worth the extra cost, right? Where they bring the car. You know, you don't have to deal with all of those layers of like dread <coughs> that most people have when they walk into a dealer. Right, right, and and you know what, and that and that's and that that's also changing the world right it, now. It is, and and I I really do think those types of dealerships and and CarMax and Carvana are a little bit different on how they work, but for the most part, that idea of not having to sit there and sweat it out and have somebody go, let me talk to my manager, I'll mm. be right back. Or, <sighs> or you know you know here's another one, and you know we've got we've dealt with some great dealerships. Uh, and so, you know, we, I don't want to draw like a broad brush stroke because, mm. you know, they're good deal like any business, there are good ones and there are bad ones. Right. But, but even this idea of like, you know, you go in sitting down with the finance manager and then two hours later you walk out of there and you're like, hey, I just, I thought I'd pay this for the car, but somehow I just... Somehow I, there's $3,000 more I'm paying or whatever. No, I can't think of anything else where, even a house, where you walk in and next thing you know... You know you're you're like, spending I, even more money. Yeah, and, how did that happen? Yeah, I, I much, it, being able to do a lot of the, uh, the work online, so you just walk in or, or just have the car delivered to you. Yeah. I got to tell you, that just was so gratifying. And the other thing that Tesla does, which I think the car dealerships will also start to, or at least manufacturers, is where they come to you with for service. Right. Right? Where, you know, we just had an issue where we had to get a key replaced uh, uh, with our um, my wife's car. Mm -hmm. You know, n not a big deal, but once again, why do I have to go to the dealership to have the key replaced? Because they have to have it reprogrammed. Why couldn't they come here? Mm -hmm. It's a you good know, point. Right? Tesla would do that. Tesla would be like, yeah, well, there, schedule well, uh, schedule. Are you kidding? They're used that? to coming here. Hell, I think Tesla could probably remotely <laughs> open the car. They probably have they something probably where they could. could trigger it or whatever. Yeah. Um, right, let's uh, let's move on because yeah. it's not about yeah. Tesla. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but right. I agree with you on Buick. They really should make a dealership change. And I seriously do think that they should sell a version of Cadillacs out there so they can come back to the car world. Their crossovers are decent, though. I will say that. Okay, let's move All right, on. So, so uh, before we get to BMW, let's talk about Mini. Uh, uh, because uh, Mini, you know, Mini's biggest issue, I think, is how do you make a retro car modern, right? I mean, they, what, what they are is they're selling the original fun-to-drive, you know, uh, Mini classic. Uh, and then what they did was they kind of 
you know, when metro cars were really popular, they kind of modernized it, put in all the safety features, which is great for one generation, but mm. how do you keep doing that? And I think they're running into kind of a, a dead end of trying to make the Mini more Mini than it was originally. Well, I, I, I actually, I, I have a different opinion. Okay. I think that their design uh, people should be fired. Actually, not fired. That's actually, right. I, I think we're saying the same thing. Well, we're sort of saying the same thing. I, I think that some of them maybe sh should be shipped off to another country or two. So, so can, I give you, can I give you a story about Please that? Please do. So I was, at, I was at the launch of the uh, Clubby, the Clubman, right? Yes, the Clubman. Uh, and they had the designer talk to us. Uh, and it was actually pretty eye-opening, and I'll tell you why. So this, this, this uh, German dude mm -hmm. walks in, right? Uh, and he's like, yes, I did design this uh, vehicle. Because obviously Mini is owned by BMW, which yes. is German. Uh, and, and to get myself kind of into the, the brand and into what Mini represents, I went to like their version of flea markets, you know, and I really immersed myself in British culture. And he ate the, fish and chips. And, and in the back of my head, I'm screaming, why don't you just get <laughs> hire a Brit <laughs> to design hire a hobby? For crying out loud. He, he was born into that culture. Why is yeah, there a German I, dude I, I, going to like flea markets to figure yeah. out what Britain is? Do you remember one of the first times I I realized Mini was in trouble. Actually, it goes back a few years. You and I tested this vehicle, and both of us agreed it was one of the worst ones they've ever built, which was the okay. Coupe. The Coupe, yeah. Which now, so what they did was they took a Mini Cooper, and they re they, they removed the, the you know the, the seats and made it smaller, and then they made the top. And this is what it was supposed to look like. Watch me here. Yeah, like that. This is what it's supposed to look like. Because a baseball cap Half, is, is so British. reversed. So this is the Germans thinking. What is very British? I tell you, it's British. We take a baseball cap, an American baseball cap, and we put it backwards, and boom, we have ourselves a new mini. Yeah, we'll call it a rugby cap. Well, it's a rugby cap. Yeah. <laughs> Look, anyway, mini, anyway. I, I love some of your engineering. I own one of your damn cars. We have like 11 of them over here at TFL. The yeah, we have too many minis. <laughs> Wait, too many minis. The We're thing, trying to de-mini de ourselves. <laughs> th th there are issues. For one, um, Mini early on made a major mistake with their CVT. Yeah, every every one of those failed in the in the second gen. The first gen is a classic, right? Right, right. right. So the second gen Mini, when BMW bought them, the first new Mini, right? Say. They they put a CVT and it had a hundred percent failure. It was right? just like the worst CVT out there ever, and and you know terrible. Don't that's, ever buy one. That's of those. pretty impressive that you could get every single one of them to fail Fortunately, eventually. They, they didn't sell that many back then. A lot of people wanted the manual. Thank God for that. So Mini since then has done this if I may they've taken a pump and they just like and just made the car expand and expand and it's not their fault people want crossovers and SUVs but they want fun cars to drive so that's what Mini's trying to address now overseas their sales aren't too bad here in the United States eh, they're not great we have we me, my wife and I have a mini countryman yep. and it's the previous generation and she adores it. She breaks the law constantly. Hopefully no cops are watching, but if you are, it's my wife, not me. Um, she, she, uh, manual transmission, all-wheel drive, perfect for Colorado. Knock on wood, we've had it for what, about five months now, and it's been solid, it's been a fun car. She loves it. Drove it back and forth to California twice before COVID. So actually, uh, eight months ago. You had it longer, yeah. Yeah, we've had it for a while. The point is, is that it was a really good car, but there are some problems with it and in order to make it look cool on the inside to make it look cool on the outside they've taken a lot of um, license with design and sometimes they overdo it and so design I, over function is that what you're saying that's exactly what i'm saying it's it's no longer it's not as functional Style as it or should. Function. Yeah. yeah now the new ones they don't quite look like minis and ever since they went to the dead fish eyes and you know what i'm talking about which is this newer generation mini where the eye the, the headlights look terrible look the headlights are the soul of the vehicle when you first thing you look at is the headlights and they look like fish that have been gutted they're, they're like dead get rid of that fire the german who did that move on F hire a brit bring him over there and say Eat your fish and chips, have your pint, show us how to make a car look kind so, of fun. So, so a couple things I would say. First of all, they've struggled like the other brands we'll be talking about, reliability. Yeah, reliability right. has been a real yeah, issue. Yeah, and you know, you think that the Germans with their manufacturing techniques could somehow, you know, take it up a notch, but it's been a real issue. Yeah, uh, there, you know, I, 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 you know, we are deep in the mini world, so I could, I don't want to go through a litany of like the different car designations and the issues they have, we'll save that for another show. Yeah, it's, it's but, a whole but, show but, but, but there are issues 
uh, and there are common failure points, and it's just not, it's not very BMW. Yeah, it, it, a lot of electronic issues, actually, and that goes through BMW and Mini, but we'll yeah. get to that in a minute with so, BMW. Yeah, so that, they got to sort that out, and they, they can do that. Number two, I think uh, they need to go back to their heritage and actually make a Mini Mini, not a Maxi Mini. Which yeah, is make a, it smaller, which they but, almost did. They had the Rocket Nun, uh, or I think it was called the Rocket Nun yeah. uh, concept, which was a smaller Mini. Now, I know one of the things that the German uh, BMW is doing is like, well, we're not going to sell that many. A car that small, not going to sell as many, especially here in the States. You might be right. But worldwide, I think you will. And on top of that, make it part of the brand. Rather than going bigger and bigger and bigger, why not go smaller as well? If you want to expand your lineup, make a smaller entry-level vehicle that's comparable to an entry-level vehicle that Japan sells. That's what I think you should Yeah, do. and then price, obviously. It, so, yeah, they price you know, themselves they, they, way they, high. They've priced themselves way up there. Uh, you know, minis were kind of, in, when they first came out in the UK, they were very everyman. Mini is now... Well, they're the most affordable cars in the yeah, UK, yeah, other Mini, than like Mini a Mini is now a very premium brand. No. Uh, and uh, it never was, but pricing-wise it is. So th I think that's a tough sell. Uh, and, uh, you know, finally, uh, the Mini that I love right now is the new electric Mini. Uh, it's super... It's a great little car. It's a great little car, yeah. So I think, you know, with that, they maybe are finding some some new way forward. Uh, it's the least expensive electric car you can buy in America. Mm -hmm. with, after the tax rebates and everything, if you get the base one, you can get it almost down to $20,000. Yeah, yeah. Which is what a Mini should be. So you got a, but the range is in 120. It's not, you know, it's an i3 basically that they repurposed. That's exactly it. And on top of that, I mean, let's face it, as a Mini E. Yeah, it's not as the range is. But for 20k, dude, 120 20, miles. But, but but it's a slightly less. And that's less, after rebates, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like 30k, and then you get seven and a half back from the feds. And, then, and here in Colorado, you get four. Yeah. On top of that, if you buy before the end of the year, so you're looking at a nineteen thousand dollar brand new electric car. Yeah, um, I, and it's if, fun to drive. If they could just bump up the range a little time, if they can get to that 200 mile mark, I think that they would sell a lot more Ooh, of those cars. That's a big ask. I know, I know. Um, it's a big ask. All right, uh, how about BMW? Well, BMW, uh, I have a very simple explanation for it. Weight and space. The face, the gesicht, the well, face. It's gone, it's gone the other way, dude, with, those, with that new open double kidney grill that's as big as... It, it's a beaver face. Some people call it beaver teeth. Other people say it looks like a, a human says, skull. Everybody says the, it looks better when you see it up close. I saw it up close. I didn't think it was better. <laughs> okay. uh, honestly, I didn't. Um, you know, and, so and, and the thing again. is, they don't like to hear. BMW does not like to hear that people don't like it. In fact, they, can't, they get really ticked off at journalists saying you know, that they feel that it's a very unattractive look. I'm going to reserve look. judgment until we see it, actually. No, I, I, I saw, I saw, it. I saw the, the, the face of it, and it was... <laughs> it, was it was not good. <laughs> no, I froze for a while and then you know, chipped away at the stone. Look, but, look, here, BMW, okay, regardless of style, right, that, that's very personal. There might be some people out there who love it. Very few. Right, 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 let, let, let's say put aside the, the problem with I think with BMW currently is first and foremost I am completely baffled and mystified by how many models they have. Once they upon a time there was like a three, five, and a seven series, right? Yeah. And then you know there was there was a crossover version of that X three, mm. X five, X seven. Now, oh my God, dude! Last time I counted, they had twenty five different model. Yeah, that's about right. And that's I think that's just you're, you're losing kind of the, the the soul of BMW when there's you know when you when you're slicing and dicing it like this one has a hatchback, this one has two doors on a coupe. You know what I mean? It, it, and this one has two doors on a sedan. I'm like, oh, what's the difference? Oh, this one, you know, is is a hatchback with two doors on a sedan. But it's not a hatchback or a sedan. It's too much. I think BMW has an identity crisis too. Yeah, I think that is. it's not just in terms of their design. I, I have an issue with their design, but in terms of. The vehicles that they're building right now, it's like they were lukewarm whether or not they were going to go electric. They were going to. They kind that's of the, did, and they the didn't problem. quite that, do That's right. the problem. They built like two very like bookends of cars, but nothing in the middle. So they built the i3, which I actually love, by the way. It's a good car. I mean, we bought one. I, I'm, issues you know, when aside. It, when it first came out, I hated it. I thought it was ugly and didn't have enough range and stupid. Now that we own one, I've really come to appreciate it. I think it's actually really some... It's some, kind of a brilliant car. Some Yeah, some brilliant engineering, especially with the range extender. I think if you were... Uh, Ford, which we'll get to next, you would build your next pickup truck with a range extender. Just saying. But anyway, um, new electric pickup with a range extender. But So they did this kind of the, the, the base one, which, you know, $50,000 isn't base, but for mm. BMW. And then they did the i8, which was brilliant in terms of its design, but not so great in terms of its actual drivetrain, right? It had a mini three-cylinder with a battery, and mm. it, you know, it... it, 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 it it couldn't cash the check that it was <laughs> that it was trying to pass along. And Just that, looking at them, though, it was such a beautiful yeah, car. Yeah, it looked like a supercar. When yeah, you got in the thing, it wasn't that 
Super it wasn't car. that super, but I st it, it was a supercar in terms quick. of getting in and out of. Uh, both <laughs> Roman and I both had to do, you know, to limber up to get in. Paul, he could just jump in there, but he's also only four feet tall. But, but you see what you see what I'm saying? They're they're like bookends. Yes, I, and they're and. But and they never fully committed to going full because they were going to for a while. They're going to do a full electric three series and everything else years ago. Yeah, they were talking about it and they didn't do it. And and then it, Tesla came along and basically took the three series that mid-sized luxury sedan, right, mm -hmm. or small luxury sedan segment to, for themselves with the Model Three. And yeah. BMW all of a sudden, you know, for the longest time, the the three series was the standard, and all of a sudden, it's not selling anymore. I think that the management at BMW needs to be shaken up, like really, truly yeah, cause, shaken cause, up. Because for a while they were like, hey, they were the best in the world. Here's the coolest electric cars we're going to build them. And then they were like, oh, electric cars aren't the future. And then they completely flip flopped and they said, now we're going to be doing electric cars. So which is it? That's kind of the problem. And then on top of that, there are cars that are currently selling today. Yeah. The, the platforms, in some cases, are very heavy. Um, they have had a lot of technical issues. Reliability is not great. BMW used to be pretty damn solid. Not anymore. And what's happening is both Tesla and to a lesser extent Mercedes-Benz are eating their lunch. And they are doing a very good job updating and doing contemporary cars. BMW seems to be sort of waffling a little bit and just kind of floating around. It's maybe like they're waiting to see which direction they should go into. Yeah, I mean, there is a, you know, there's a new electric car coming. Uh, I actually was watching some, I'm, I'm into weird sports. Mm -hmm. So I was watching the, Deca the decathlon where you, know, where you cross country ski and shoot. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, was, I, I you know, love that stuff. And they had the new electric car there, you know, in Europe, it's already there. Yeah. Um, so it's coming, it's a new electric, all, all electric crossover. They're saying, you know, it will compete with the Model Y, mm. um, probably the Volkswagen um, ID4. I would imagine it'll be far more expensive than the Yeah, but it's in, in the same segment. Yeah, though. so yeah. it is coming, but um, yeah, I think they need to. I think you're right. I think they they need to figure out which direction they're going and go with it's, it. BMW used to build the best driving cars in the world. I mean, I I still remember driving the Z4 when it, the new one uh, when it came out with the hardtop convertible, and I, I didn't like the old one very much, the Z3. So I drove the Z4, and I'm just thinking it had a manual transmission, straight six turbo. It was great. What a fun car that was. Just phenomenal. And I kept thinking, if BMW can keep doing this, making me feel this good about driving their cars, they'll have no problems. Yeah, just, you know, let's face it, a, you know, a lot of the electric cars, uh, especially Tesla right now, um, you know, in a straight line, they're quick, but around a track. Um, don't, don't send us emails, all you Tesla Roddy. We know they're not great around the track. They're just not. They're, they're, no. You can tell they're figuring it out. They haven't quite gotten the, their kind of chassis and suspension they're calibration. They're not as, as exhilarating to take around the track. And, and we have that from a professional race car well, well, driver. Well, the, the dirty secret to any Tesla is it will derate itself because it will start to overheat because it's putting out so much energy, right, mm -hmm. that in order for it to basically not catch on fire, it has to derate itself. So right. you take any Tesla around a track, for, forget about the, you know, the dynamics of it, it will derate itself, and it will derate itself after one or two laps. Going back to BMW, BMWs around a track, the equivalent cars are much more fun still to take around yeah. the track. But I go back to the whole thing about the platforms being kind of heavy, the electronics having issues, reliability being an issue, um, and overall they just need to, I think, I think change direction. Yeah, pick a direction and you know and just stick commit. with it. Yeah, and, and and stick with it and commit to it. I'd love to see an all electric BMW uh, that actually performs well. Once Here again, in the states. Once again, I'd love to see an all electric sports car. The last one was a Tesla model uh, Roadster, right? And since yeah. then, we haven't had anything. So this was about like a decade ago. Yeah, exactly. All right, yeah. let's get to the big blue oval, Nathan Ford. Now Ford doesn't need a lot. They they made know. a couple. No, no, this, this is uh, you and I are very different on this. I was really against them completely killing off their cars. So in which, America, you probably know this, Ford has committed to not building cars anymore. Except for the Mustang. Yeah. So the Mustang, and Mustang is a great pony car. Every single one I've driven, even the four-cylinder, I've loved them. They're great. But they no longer build a passenger vehicle that is considered a sedan. They're gone. No wagons. Gone. No economy cars, and they had a really good economy car. We had one. We had their little tiny uh, Fiesta. It was a great little car. It wasn't perfect, but so, it was a great little car. So once again, let me take some perspective on this. So, all right, please. So, so once upon a time, before before you know it all went to hell back ten years ago, Ford used to build like a different car for America with the same name that it built for Europe, that it built for Asia, right? Mm. So they would build these cars that were 
same name, Focus, but they were very different cars. Yeah. Uh, and then the company, you know, uh, was the only company that didn't actually borrow money. They, they actually mortgaged their brand, I think, for $25 billion, right? And then they brought in Ellen Mullally, who was the, at the time, CEO of Boeing, I think, to restructure the company. Yeah, and, and he did a fine job. And what he did was he, he created this uh, um, one Ford strategy. And he said, we're no longer building different cars, so the focus is gonna be the same car in Europe as it is in America, as it is in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, people don't need necessarily different types of driving dynamics. We'll just do one really good car. And you could see it, right? You could, there was a moment in time where there was like old Ford and new Ford, right? Mm -hmm. Old Ford was a lot of like, you could see like the, 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 the cost cutting. You could see the, the accountant's hand in the vehicle, right? Without the plastics were cheap. And when Alan came in, like the focus you got in Europe was the same focus you got here. The styling was very similar. Uh, and I loved it, dude. I really loved it, right? It was a fantastic car, too. It was, yeah. Then, and a Fiesta, too. And then I, Alan, I really liked the Fiesta. Then Alan left. Mm -hmm. And Ford kind of went back to the way it used to, used to do business. Yeah, they, they cut corners. And then... Uh, two years ago now, they made the announcement that they're done building cars in the yeah, United they, they States. They hired a guy who came from uh, he, he came from um, furniture, office furniture, as their CEO. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, keep in mind, Ford is still very much family owned. Yes. Even though it's on the stock market, the family still very much controls it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they do. Uh, and you know, and so so the CEO of Ford doesn't just have to answer to the stock market. He has to answer to the Ford family, family. As well. right? And so you know, they they hired a guy. Who came from you know Steelcase, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know took a very kind of um, uh, I don't know modular approach to building cars, which which has proven to be an interesting choice. Not necessarily a totally negative choice, but a lot of fans are disenfranchised with the fact they can no longer buy a Fusion or you know a Focus or any of that, and they can only buy crossovers. And they made a mistake early on. They decided to enter the uh, entry-level small crossover segment with the uh, EcoSport, mm. Echo Sport. I, I get yelled at by calling it Eco. Even I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, a vehicle that doesn't look too bad, but unfortunately, in terms of dynamics, just doesn't quite compete with a lot of the competitors out there. Um, it's 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 selling, but it's it's not their biggest seller and everything else. And I think what that did is I sort of lowered the waters for Ford once they got rid of their cars, and they're like, well, this is the least expensive vehicle we now offer. Here's the EcoSport. Uh, sorry, you know, that, that was what they had to do. Now, on the other side of the planet, you know, where people are buying, you know, other Ford vehicles, they're thrilled with what Ford's doing. They still build little cars and everything else overseas. Here, they don't. So, they do build trucks, and Ford basically said, we're building trucks from here on, except for the Mustang. And that has proven to be kind of a double-edged thing. I think that their uh, Bronco, the whole Bronco thing, despite media issues here and there, is brilliant. They've done a wonderful idea with getting it out there, getting the message out there, building the vehicle, making it what the people want. So I think Ford is on a roll in terms of actually, you know, coming out with cars that people want. I think the Bronco's a hit. Yes, that and the Bronco the, Sport. People uh, are liking it. Uh, people, yeah, the Bronco Sport. I think, I think <clears> they're the issue. If I were, if I were in Ford, they probably couldn't do it because of the way that just time it worked out. But once again, it's that Nissan. XD diesel problem, right? They should have came up with the Bronco first and then the Sport. I absolutely agree. They right. shouldn't have introduced them at the same time. Because now, I think now, it muddied the waters. Because now it's like, hey, we got this really cool Bronco, but you can buy this kind of mini Bronco, right? right. As opposed to, we got this really cool Bronco, and if you can't quite afford it, or if you can't quite you you know, don't like, need it. Yeah, deal with the big tires and bad fuel economy, there's this nice one over here, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the Renegade didn't come out before the Wrangler. Right, it, it, it's the other way around. Right, of course. And, by, and by, and by so I think margin. they've got that problem, uh, but the Bronco <laughs> is a hit. Um, uh, I, I also would think the new F one fifty is a hit. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, they, they've really kind of you know, uh, and the that hybrid is epic. And the Mach E, we'll see. Well, the Mach E is a problem. So here's the thing: I think that the car itself is fine. Yeah. Uh, the numbers look really good. I rode in one. They didn't let me drive it. Fine. It was okay. Um, it's sort of a little SUV ish, hatchbacky type thing. And it's sort of a car, so that's nice. Here's the problem, Roman. They call it a Mustang. They should have never, ever, ever called it a Mustang. It's a great electric car from all the numbers that I'm seeing. I haven't driven it yet. But it should not be called a Mustang. The Ford Mustang thing, there's a lot of fans out there that are really ticked off about it. I think that their PR people need to seriously think about stuff like this in the future. 
because if you keep throwing a name out there just saying, well, people will appreciate it because it's called something, but you took the whole DNA out of it, I don't think it's a good idea. In fact, I think it's going to hurt you. So, so here's, my, here's my prediction, okay? Please. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about, first, we'll talk about the Maki. I think the Maki will sell for the, for the first six months, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure it's going to sell after that, and I'll tell you why. Mm. Uh, I just don't think that the Ford dealers want it. I don't think they're prepared to sell it. And even though the, the car company itself has done a good job, I don't think that, that, that when you walk into a Ford dealership, you're going to get a warm reception if you want to buy a Mach-E. I just, you know, I, I was- I, You I, might I, be right. I was, I was at a Ford dealership recently, I'm not going to name names. They had like one electric charger sitting on the side of the building collecting dust. Yeah. And, and that to me, you know, tells you, and the reason that, that the dealers don't want it is because there's not a lot of service, right? No, you, you make very little in terms of service right. and, and they make a ton of money on service so, so, in their so, vehicles. So you've got this partner, you know, who's saying, uh, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather have the new F-150. Uh, and so I think, like I say, initially the people who went and bought it will, will, will get them, they'll probably like them, but I think Ford's going to have a really hard time selling mach -E's because I think they're going to, you know, they're going to be selling it into a really strong headwind in their dealer network. And, and I think much. Nissan had that same problem. Mm, to a certain degree, yeah, right? although I think Nissan was actually better prepared with, for with, it. They were a little bit better prepared with, yeah. with the Leaf. Yeah. I think GM to some extent had that same problem. Oh, they're having the a big problem with that Cadillac right now. Uh, with the Bolt, right? Yeah. Right? And I think Ford's going to run into that run into that meat grinder uh, when it comes to the mach -E. So that, that's a Mach-E. But here's my biggest, uh, uh, I think, and I think this is a fair criticism of Ford. Ford is having a really hard time executing, actually. Right to call the the rollout of the oh, Explorer that. a train wreck would be kind, mm, right? Yeah, that right? They, they really got hit hard on that. Yeah, yeah, they're just not, somehow they're really having a hard time building vehicles. And, you know, it could be COVID, but the Explorer was before COVID for the most part. And look look at the things we're talking about now. We're talking about the F one hundred and fifty that mm. was supposed to be out in October. Yeah, right. You go to a dealer. There's no new F one hundred and fifty yet. We've got we're one just hitting the lots now. They're, Maybe, Just. maybe, yeah, maybe. Well, I got a report. I, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe, but they should have been out, right? And, no, and, and last month, Ford pickup truck sales, which is the goose that laid the golden egg, fell 49%. Yeah, now part of that is COVID, but the other part is, you were right, though the rollout has been delayed by so long. Bronco and, just got uh, delayed. Bronco got delayed yet again. Yet again. And then there's a lot of fans who are really upset about it. Now, once again, they're doing their best to try to make these things happen. And these but, are like self-inflicted wounds, you know? Yeah. You know, so if, if you, you know, you've got this, you, you, there's two parts of it, right? You got to get the car right, which they did with the Bronco. You got to mm. get the truck right, which they did, but then you got to actually execute on it. Yeah, you got, you got it. Your fans are going to, and they're going to go somewhere else and, if, if and they the have to wait too long. it really hurt them. Yeah. It, that rollout just really hurt them. But you know the thing with the Bronco, that can, we can take that back, what, about four years now, around the time they made the announcement, and all of a sudden nothing. Announcement and then nothing. And fans were really ticked off. And I think that a lot of people did turn to FCA products and oh, buy Jeep. Jeep. Sold, yeah, Jeep yeah. sold so many Wranglers since the, I don't know, it's hundreds of thousands since Ford yeah. announced the Bronco. And that's exactly, I think a lot of those people were just like, okay, it's been two years, nothing. You know, it's been three years, nothing. You know, so I think that that is really hurting. So, and, and the other problem, Nathan, is mm. timing. And this has nothing to do with Ford, right? Uh, you know, uh, you know, we've, we've had a lo 10 years of strong vehicle sales. Yeah. Uh, and these things are cyclical. And, you know, if you look, read the tea leaves, I'm not sure where this economy is going, but if I were a betting man, I'd say it's not going up. And, uh, and, and you I roll, think it's going to take a year to, to try to, you know, get past the whole COVID downturn. And, you, and you're, rolling, you're rolling out, you know, very important product launches at a, you know, F-150, your most important one. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the Bronco, of course, at a time when, when you're not only um, you know, having trouble executing on those launches, but you're also selling into a market that's probably going the opposite way. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a difficult thing to actually get back those numbers that we had just previously to 2019, 2018. Great years for Ford. All right. Let's move on. JLR. This is yeah, our Land Rover. I'll just so a, we're going to try to not spend an hour on uh, I'll, I'll give JLR. you two minute history, right? Okay, so JLR, <laughs> Jaguar Land Rover, right? Are, once upon a time, we're separate car, car companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, once again, when it all went south 10 years ago, uh, Ford decided that they were going to, because the car companies were up for sale, we're going to buy them. Well, actually, no, Ford, Ford sold them around that time. 
Well, oh yeah, that they bought it ahead of time. You're right. So way, first, yeah, yeah, way so before. first for, so Ford first bought them. I apologize. You're right. They yeah. bought them and then they combined them into what they call their premium automotive group, right? Mm -hmm. So they had uh, Jaguar, Land Rover, and Volvo. And Volvo. And they yeah. kind of combined them. Yeah, they, they did a lot right? of part sharing yeah. and everything else, which wasn't necessarily a bad no, thing. No, no, it was like a premium automotive group, right? right? In terms of their strategy. And then you're right. Ten years ago, when it all went to hell, Ford decided, well, we need cash, mm -hmm. so now we're going to mortgage the brand, but we're going to sell off these things. So they sold off JLR. Jerry Rolando over to Tata, an Indian company, uh, and they sold off Volvo, of course, uh, to the Chinese. Yeah. And, and Aston Martin. And Aston that, Martin. That was also part of it. And, the and, and their partnership in Mazda was also uh, reduced significantly. So anyway, so we'll get to those other brands later. Yeah, 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 some other time. But but let's talk about JLR. So since that time, you know, Tata infused a lot of money into, into, the, into the company, and they yep. said, here's you know, billions of dollars, and then after that, you guys go and do your own thing. And you know, make yourselves profitable. Uh, and because of the crossover slash SUV boom, Land Rover has been doing really well, right? Yes. Any, any car company that, that in the last ten years that does nothing but sell crossovers, because that's crossovers have gone through the roof, has done extremely well. And that includes yep. Jeep. Yep. And that includes Land Rover, right? Oh yeah. Right, because that, they, they don't have any cars. No, no, they only have crossovers and SUVs. Right, and overseas their numbers are quite good, and in the states some of their numbers are pretty so, decent. So, so let's put those guys aside. And then in the meantime, you know, Tata or JLR decided that they were going to combine the two, not just in terms of their name, but also in terms of their dealerships. So mm -hmm. now you've got a situation where you've got Jaguar and Land Rover dealerships stuck together. Uh, and it's a very difficult situation for the dealers because Land Rovers are selling and Jaguars aren't. Yeah, now, and, 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 you know, so it's like you walk in there and you've got, all, you've got these two brands and one of the, and, and there's also a whole other thing, Land Rover, Range Rover, it's very confusing. But, but, but anyway, the Jaguar part of the JLR is not working. So let's talk about that first. Okay, Why no, isn't Jaguar working? The only vehicle that is selling, the is, and that's basically you know, the crossover. In order, in order to build an, a sellable vehicle in the United States for Jaguar, they basically had to build something very similar to a Land Rover. And I mean, that's what they basically had to do. And their F Pace is um, their crossover. Yeah. And it, it mid size crossover company. It's 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 sort of a the Jaguar of crossovers. We love it. I, I've driven several of them, and every single one is enjoyable to drive. They are, I think, decent looking. But the problem is, is that Jaguar is not an SUV company. Jaguar is a car company. And it's always been a it's always been a very strong brand for a car company, right? People when they think of Jaguars, they think of like uh, not the F Pace, uh, but they think of the D Type. Yeah. Yeah, right. E-types and D-types. E-types, right. That's what they think of, right? Mm -hmm. The convertible yeah. two-door sports car. And, and so it's really hard to turn that ship around and say, hey, we're no longer the two-door sports car because nobody wants two-door sports cars. We're now selling crossovers. And you know what the problem is? It's, it's the opposite problem that Mini and, and um, uh, BMW have in one respect because I think that some of the designs that Jaguar's coming up with is, is okay. F-Type is brilliant. Brilliant. Beautiful brilliant. cars. Yeah. Their cars look great. Their interiors are beautiful. So they do a lot of things right. Unfortunately, reliability throughout the entire JLR world is yeah, a major out. issue. And we yeah. know it, baby. We know it. Yeah, we know it. It might be one of, the, you know, one of these cases where, you know, um, uh, you know the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yeah. And not all wheels are squeaky. But, but the problem in real world terms is it doesn't take a lot of squeaky wheels to establish a reputation. That's a real problem. So what we're basically proposing here to fix it, because this is part of the podcast, is what we're going to do to fix it. Um, your designs are beautiful. The interiors are great. They handle awesome. You need to fix your reliability, so you need additional investment to figure out exactly what's going on, what's going wrong, and how to fix it and take care of it and make a huge announcement. Turn it into PR. We are now far more reliable make it so very british when you say it too so you know you know what i think i think one of the one of the things that's hurting these guys is they're actually a small company compared to like other companies right compared to toyota and lexus that's right compare, i mean that's the world's biggest company and they're in a way uh, not on the cutting edge but sometimes on the bleeding edge of technology right so a lot of the technology that goes into these cars is really cool right uh and like i remember like seeing that the act activity key that you get with oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah the armband thing the armband right that, yeah, that that's kind of cool, cool. 
like our Defender is a classic example of that. The camera where you can see through the hood. That's really cool. Right, or you can see, you know, like, like not just the, the bird's eye view, but it's like a movie camera where you can actually spin it around. You can, you can, yeah, I, I mean, it probably is useless on the trails, but it's really cool tech. But, and but people saying, love this is, tech. This is really cool tech, but it's really cutting edge tech. I mean, there's a reason that Toyota Tacoma still has this brakes. You know, on the back because because they're reliable and they work and they you don't mean, break. You mean drums? Drum brakes, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. drum brakes on the on the rear wheels, right? Because they're or, reliable. Or a five-speed automatic transmission or, on the or, Forerunner. Forerunner yeah. has a five-speed, right? Yeah, it right. works. They have built hundreds of thousands of them and they don't break. And so maybe maybe I would I would kindly suggest that maybe you guys need to kind of just take a step back and and. Uh, you know, maybe not be so cutting edge because the cutting edge stuff is always going to be problematic. Yeah, you know, I and that's what happened. You know, our, our I, camera manual our, died. The first thing that happened was the camera, and then all the other issues. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah we have we, God, we had so many. Here, here's here's I, I picture this. I picture that some young guys came into the JLR office with new designs and new showing the tech, saying, "Look, we have this. This is brand new tech, cutting edge. Nobody else has it. Put it on your vehicles. You're going to sell a million of them because everybody wants this tech." What they neglected to mention is, well, we haven't really done that much testing with it, and we really don't know about how reliable it is. But they kind of left that out. Well, they I'll just give you, brought I'll them give the you a good tech. example of that. So the second one, the second Defender we had, uh, was made um, redundant, <laughs> as the British like to say, no, was was, was died because we, uh, you know, had asked for a winch, uh, and they had tried to incorporate the winch. And now, if you get a winch on a Jeep Wrangler, right? It's a pretty straightforward process. You pull off this big, big bumper, bumper and you stick on a different bumper that's winch yeah. ready and you stick the winch on top of it. Yeah, yeah, you hook it up to the Electrex and, right. and, and just a couple of hours, barely like, worth the work. With, with the Defender, right, they've, they've, they've done such a magnificently beautiful job of integrating the winch into the front fascia that you can't tell it's actually a different front fascia, right? Right. But because of that, you know, that styling design uh, uh, requirement, it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, there's a series out there which we we're watching, uh, and they were actually trying to install the winch on the front of the vehicle. You got to pull that whole front end off. The you entire front end has to come off. Come yeah, off. You got to cut things. You got to, you know, I mean, I mean, I could see why why that dealership cut through, uh, you know, a, a harness because it's a very complicated job, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, you know, it's the exact opposite of pulling a bumper off, slapping another one on, you know, tightening a couple of bolts and going. So, so, so maybe guys, don't don't get so stuck on the design of it. But you know, make it a little bit simpler and easier. Well, the bottom line here is that they built the Defender, and I didn't want to sit here too long and, and, and jump on the Defender because we still have one, and we're going to take it off road and we're going to drive it, and hopefully everything, knock on wood, works and we'll have a wonderful time. But if you're marketing a vehicle, seriously marketing it and taking people to where Marrakesh or whatever, where where do they take them for that press event that we didn't go to? In the Middle East somewhere. Anyway, the point is, is that if you're going to take people and bounce Namibia, around off Namibia. road, Namibia, Namibia, that's right. If you're going to, so was the middle uh, Africa. Anyway, off road, pound this vehicle built to be pounded. Then you need to make it so it can actually have these off road accessories that you've shown with concepts, so people can actually do that, even if they never use a winch. And I know that some of you guys are arguing in your JLR office, nobody's ever going to use that winch. We'll have one out of a thousand people use that winch. Doesn't matter. The fact is, if that's what the people want, you need to provide it and you need to make it easy to put on. Maybe make a modular component that'll just pop right on there. Of course, then again, that's more tech and that's, that's more tech that can go wrong. But my point is, if you're going to build a vehicle and market it towards a certain class of driver, you need to take it up. I mean, they were, re they were really ambitious, right? With They're all extremely the, ambitious. Right, with the winch, with the... Uh, a snorkel, you know, with the, oh, the, roof the rack, box on the side, which the is box. still kind of weird. It's, it's just, yeah, it's just, you know, uh, and Ladder. I applaud that. I love it. It's cool, but maybe, maybe, you know. Make it work? Maybe. maybe I'm sorry, but that's the bottom line. Make it work. So if you are, you know, in the brain trust of JLR, consider this. If you have a market out there where people are seriously going to beat up the vehicle, make sure that it can handle it, and more importantly, make sure that those same people can get what they want. And, and we're not even talking about the fact that, like, the new Defender is not um, spiritually, in many ways, even related to the old Defender. Oh, it's not at all. I mean, it doesn't have solid axles. It doesn't yeah, have the yeah, same... I, I mean, you know, if, if we really were, you know, looking at it in, in, a, in a kind of... Uh, um, hard-eyed, steely-eyed sort of way, I would say, why didn't you make the Defender like what it used to be, right? No, Just make it simple, make it make it Because they have confident. a platform, they're gonna, and they want to save some money, so they're going to use their... Maybe the new 80 is going to be right. There's a new, there's a 90, and then there's a new 80 coming, which is supposed to be... 
But you know, that, but that's to, to be me, that, you know, G, if you look at like, if you look at if you look at the Wrangler and you look at the Defender, right, the Land Rover, they started in two similar places. Right, right? they were ag agricultural, agrarian kind of things, but the Jeep has stayed to that. Right? Yeah. I mean, sure, it's got ABS and it's got you know all these. Oh, it's got a lot of tech now. But it's pretty much still. A, a, a dedicated off-roader. The, the bottom line with, with the Wrangler, if you're going to compare the two, is that the Wrangler still has the DNA of what the original Wrangler did, the, and the, then going the back Defender to the Defender now directly competes with a Land Cruiser mm -hmm. more than it does with the Wrangler. I yeah. mean, there's no other way, right? It, yeah. Even price-wise, they're competing. Yeah, yeah, completely different vehicle. And the old one didn't. The old one was this, you know. It's and I like. I'm not saying the old one was the best way, but wh why not keep it that way? Yeah. Well. Bottom line is that we... We're, we're uh, out of time. The time just walked in, we're out of time. Oh, we're out of time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Sorry, Tommy. Sorry, sorry to, to drag it on too well, much, buddy. Well, well, I think there's a couple more brands that we have to talk about. Yeah, uh, so, so another time we will cover some so more brands. So there'll be a part three. So thank you guys for watching. Part three. Uh, and uh, let us know in the comments below what you think about all of these brands. We, we read your comments and uh, we take them to heart. Yes, we do, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. See you guys next time. Ciao.